Perfect, then we'll just give it like five seconds and then I'll go for it. All righty, hello everyone. Um, I hope you guys are doing amazing today. My name is Hannah and I'm gonna be facilitating today's session with Dr. Lolo. Dr. Lolo, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Hi everyone. So my name is Dr. Patrick Lolo, as everybody already know, and if you don't know, this is I. Um, so I'm a pediatric dentist, but before we get to all of those details, uh, I'm going to introduce you guys to myself. Here's the slide. So yes, so my name is Dr. Patrick Sebastian Lolo. Uh, I currently work at Nicholas Children Hospital, and I also work at Gators Tooth Team, and they're both in Miami, Florida, okay? I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about myself. This is going to be a super, super fun presentation. You guys already know I am a pediatric dentist, so I'm very energetic. It kind of sucks that I can't interact with all of you guys right now because I would love to interact with you guys but we'll save all of your questions for the end of the presentation. So make sure you guys pay attention. I'm gonna to try to be as quick as possible, but as concise as possible, because I wanna give you guys as much information, okay? All right. So what are we gonna be talking about today? So we're gonna be talking about my education, where did I go to school and stuff like that? What did I specialize in and where do I currently practice, the type of practice that I'm working on? Um, mission trips that I've put together in the past with my friends and stuff of that nature. And I'm also going to be going over some case presentation. So the case presentations are going to be very, very important. Anyone that's interested in pediatric dentistry, the way that I'm going to format these case presentations, they're pretty much the same way that the board of dentistry uh, presents them. So pretty much uh, a lot of you guys don't know. So to become a pediatric dentist, you do have to take another board examination. And one of those examinations is an oral board. So you stand in front of a group of people and they're asking you a bunch of questions and you pretty much are orally just presenting your cases. So this is pretty much the format of these cases that I put together. So it's gonna be a little bit helpful for you guys. All right, let's proceed. So education, before I get started with uh, Florida, uh, my um, undergraduate career, I wanna introduce you guys to myself as far as where I'm from. So I'm originally from uh, Port-au-Prince, Haiti, for any guys that don't know where that is. Haiti is an island in the Caribbean. Um, it's near Cuba and those areas. Um, I moved to America when I was about 10 years old. Um, I moved with my mom and my three older sisters. I'm the youngest out of four. Um, I'm the baby boy. Um, and my sisters, um, my oldest sister is a pharmacist, actually. And then my sisters are nurses. And my mom's a nurse. So we're pretty much from all from a, a medical background. So and I'm the one that wanted to go into dentistry and kind of diversify the family a bit. Um, when I moved to America, we originally moved to Miramar, Florida. I'm not sure if you guys know what that is about 20 minutes away from Miami, um, attended Miramar High School where I played all types of sports. Then after Miramar High School, I attended Florida International University, which stated above. Um, I started there in 2007 and graduated in 2011, had my bachelor's in biology with a minor's in chemistry, all right? So once I graduated uh, from FIU in 2011, I then went on to attend the University of Florida College of Dentistry in 2011, to 2015 for my doctorate in uh, dentistry. Uh, so why did I choose uh, University of Florida? I'm sure a lot of you guys have that question. So you, one of the main reason I chose UF is because it's a it's my home school. The tuition was pretty low. Um, and I have a couple more reasons and I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll cover them a bit towards the end. But those were kind of like my two main reasons. I wanted to stay in my home state school because that's where I wanted to work. So I wanted to be familiar. I wanted to get a degree or a, a, a license, I should say, the, to pretty much practice in that state that I wanted uh, to live in. So that's one of the main reasons why I attended University of Florida. Uh, graduated in 2015. Um, and then after I graduated, went on to do my residency at Nicholas Children Hospital. So Nicholas Children Hospital was formerly known as Miami Children Hospital. If you guys don't know the name, um, it's a brand new name. So that name, we transitioned about, I want to say, three years, three or four years ago, we changed the name. So it used to be called Miami Children, now it's Nicholas Children. Um, so I did my residency there, started in 2015, and I finished in 2017. Um, in residency, I was both the lead resident and the chief resident, and I also received the Resident of the Year Award and had the opportunity to present my research paper all across the nation. So I was very honored by that. So pretty much I did my education straight through. I know a lot of people choose to take a break, there's nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? Um, I, I choose to uh, tell people when you're doing your schooling to go straight through just because you're more focused if you go straight through. I have a lot of friends that, you know, they did their four years of undergrad. Then they took a year off to work 
or they did a year to uh, do a master's in something else, uh, like biochemistry, for example, and then went on to, uh, to dental school. There's nothing wrong with that. I also had some friends that, you know, they did their bachelor's, then they went on to dental school. Then they went on to work as a dentist, as a general dentist. And then they went back to school to specialize um, in whatever specialty that they wanted to do. I chose to go all the way through just because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so after my um, um, uh, bachelor's, I went straight on to do my doctorate. And then after that, I went straight on to do my residency. Um, in college, I did have a couple of scholarships listed below. Um, and those are a couple of my accomplishments. So you guys can read that. So we're gonna proceed. So why did I choose my specialty and what is my specialty? So I'm currently, I am a pediatric dentist. It was formerly known as a pedodontist. So we don't use the word pedodontist anymore because it's too closely related to another word. So we just use pediatric dentist, okay? So what is a pediatric dentist and what do we do um, um, in pediatric dentistry? So pediatric dentistry is pretty much uh, an age-defined specialty that provide comprehensive care to the oral health care of infant and children. And the most specific thing is it also includes people with special needs. So that's very important. So I can have a patient that's pretty much 35 years old. As long as they're a special needs patient, they're technically under the care of a pediatric dentist. So you're, you'll find a lot of um, your, your patients, you know, that are under the spectrum of autism or um, what should I say, Down syndrome and things of that nature or the development of delayed. They might be 30 or 35 years old, but technically they still fall under the care of a pediatric dentist. So not only are we taking care of infants and children and through their adolescence year, but as they grow on through their adult years, if they're a special needs individual, and if they don't have anyone else to take care of them, as a pediatric dentist, it is our duty to take care of those individuals. So that's something I want you guys to be aware of as a pediatric dentist. You guys see us hanging around with a lot of kids and, and, and doing all these cute stuff with kids, but we do treat certain adults um, as long as they fall under the special uh, healthcare needs, okay? Um, so why did I choose uh, my specialty where I love working with, uh, with children? If any of you guys see my social media or follow me, um, I'm a big kid at heart. I have a lot of energy. I'm always running up and down. And all the other specialties didn't really quite fit my personality. Um, I checked out um, um, oral surgery, which was pretty cool. I love doing surgery, but it was a little too serious for me. Checked out um, um, uh, periodontist, too serious, a lot of the older population as well. Um, I checked out um, um, even orthodontists, I, which, which was, you know, they deal with kids as well, but um, they don't really deal with kids on a, on a physical basis. Um, and, and the way that I want to describe is they're not in there and treating these kids for, for decay or for disease. They're treating, they're mostly treating for aesthetics, which is great. You know, I don't have anything against ortho, uh, the orthodontist, but I wanted to be more so in the line of feeling more so as a physician where I'm making a difference on a daily, uh, on a daily basis of these children and able to impact their daily living life. So that's the reason why I wanted to go into pediatric dentistry. Um, I also felt like you can actually mold and change kids and influence them into becoming better uh, dental patients. And I find that very difficult with the adult population. I don't know if you guys, um, if you, some of you guys are dentists in here, you might have um, you know, adult patients and it's very, very hard to get across to adult patients. You might tell them to do something. You might tell them not to do something. They may or may not listen to you. Well, for kids, it's quite the opposite. If you're great at your job, if, you're, if you love what you do, your, your patients are going to love you. They're going to look up to you. So you're going to kind of be like a role model to them. So whatever you say is kind of like everything. So pretty much I can bring a kid to my chair, make them become my friend and tell them a story. The story might be way off. As long as I'm on the same page with the parents, they're going to believe every single thing that I say. So that's one of the main things that I love about my specialty is being able to work with kids, impacting their kids, molding them into uh, great dental patients and reducing their dental fears. And I love doing all of those things. So where do I currently practice? So currently I practice in two separate locations. Um, I'm a faculty attending. I know I'm a little young, but I am a faculty attending at Nicholas Children's Hospital. I've been a faculty attending there for three years. So after I finished my residency, um, I guess they liked me a lot and they offered me a position to stay. So I ended up staying there. So from 2017, when I graduated up until now, 2021, I've been working at Nickus Children as a faculty attending uh, Monday through Thursdays. But on my Fridays, which is my off days, I do part time at a 
uh, pediatric office, which is called Gator Tooth Team. Um, and that office is in uh, Boca Raton, Florida, and I'm an associate pediatric dentist at that spot. So the great thing about what I do, I get to see both sides. So I am an attending, I, I work in a hospital, but I also work at a private office. Um, there's pros and cons to both. I love being in the hospital because I'm around residents, you know, people my age. I get to teach them. I'm learning all the new things about dentistry, all the new researches that comes out, all the new gadget that might come out, you know, so we're new day and age dentistry when we're working in a, a hospital because you're teaching, right? Um, and the private office is quite different. You know, you're technically, you know, most private, uh, most private practitioner, you know, they have their own belief. So whatever their belief is, is usually what they have in their office. So it's limited to that. And the other pros and cons I would say for the hospital is the hospital is, um, is an, it's an institution that you're surrounded by a bunch of individuals. So you get to work with a lot of other individuals. You get to pick their brain, which could be great. But con is there could also be a lot of politic and, uh, poli uh, politics, I should say, in the hospital because you're working with a lot of people. There's a bunch of different people in, uh, uh, that are on top of you. You have your boss and you have the boss of the boss. So not everything you say as a physician or as a dentist is the final say because you do have other people's involved. In a private office, you get to do what you want. You know, it's your office, it's your baby, whatever you say goes. So whichever one fits your personality the best, you know, I would go for. The reason why I'm doing both is um, they gave me a great opportunity at the hospital. They offered me loan repayment program which, um, that helps recruit minorities to teach, which so I couldn't pass off an opportunity. As you guys know, as dentists, we have a lot of uh, I couldn't pass up the opportunity, but my ultimate goal is to transition completely to the private office and doing part time at the hospital where I'm still teaching students, but I'm more in a private office. So right now I'm more in a hospital and less in a private office setting. Um, so what are some important factors for you guys? Let's say if you're, you know, you're finishing school, you're becoming a pediatric dentist or even a general dentist and you're looking to apply for jobs. You know, should you go work at a hospital? Should you work at a private office? Should you work um, at a corporate uh, dental office? Meaning, you know, there's different dental offices that have different chains where it's um, it's and it's a one owner that bought a bunch of different offices and they have a different staff working. I think all of those um, positions are phenomenal, but in my opinion, I think your first job should be somewhere where you maximize your learning potentials. And that was another reason why I chose to stay at the hospital, even though the pay wasn't you know as high as working at a private office. I know as a student fresh out of school, that would maximize my learning ability. So therefore, I know in the long run, I would my knowledge would be far more greater than a dentist that just went straight out and started working at a private office. So that was one of the things that I took into consideration. The other thing um, I took into consideration is mentorship. I truly believe every level of your life, you should find a mentor. So, and that's what I thrive to do. And one of the reasons why I ended up staying at uh, the hospital is because my mentor worked at the hospital. So I felt like I, would, I was able to gain much more from him, okay? So finding somewhere you, you could maximize your learning ability and a mentor is the best way to go. Um, the money might not be there originally, but I think in the long run is gonna be the best thing. I know a lot of people that wanna come out and open practices and do things on their own. That's phenomenal. I'm not saying there's anything with that. But I'm just talking from my perspective. I just value doing things the long way, meaning learning as much as possible, being in the background, and then opening up shop. Um, other people like to do it the other way around, which there's nothing wrong with that. So next topic I wanted to talk about are mission trips. So for anyone that's like a dental student or anyone that's um, even a, a dentist that's out there, that's looking into getting into pediatric dentistry, a great way to get more experience is through mission trips. And I highly, highly recommend that. The reason being is a lot of time in dental school, you don't get a lot of experience in pediatric dentistry. Why? A lot of the work goes to the residents. And, and, and a lot of time the parents don't really trust, you know, students treating their kids. They would much prefer um, the residents or an actual dentist. So you don't get a lot of that experience. So how do you get more experiences? You know, you have to shadow, obviously, get out there and shadow dentists. And the other thing is doing mission trips. Yeah, obviously, I know we're in COVID right now. A lot of the mission trips have probably been stalling or, you know, they cancel a couple of them. But as soon as things get back up and running, I highly, highly recommend you guys look into doing mission trip. 
one of the mission trips that I um, had the honor of being involved with with the University of Florida is the Bahamas mission trip. So what that is, is a mission trip that myself and a couple of colleagues while we were at UF, we came together, we were like, we want more experience in pediatric dentistry. So we were like, why don't we create a trip that we see more kids? So what we did is we went to the faculty, we went to uh, the pediatric dental uh, uh, faculty office, and we started talking to the faculty. It was like, hey, we want to do a trip where we go somewhere where we're, you know, we're in middle schools, where we're elementary schools, where we're actually catering to children. So therefore, dental students that want to go and become pediatric dentists could get that, um, could get that, um, um, could get those um, hands-on experiences, for lack of a better word. So that's what we did. We had a bunch of support. We had dentists from the community, pediatric dentists from the community, pediatric dentists from the school, staff from the school. We got together. We raised funds by calling different vendors. It was a long and tedious process, but we got it done. And that trip was pretty much a yearly trip that we did where we took about 20 dental students from the University of Florida, and we took them to the Bahamas, and we would go to different elementary schools or middle schools, and we would set up our shops, our little uh, mobile dental units, for lack of a better word. And we would do um, oral health screening for kids, just you know, basic screening. We would do basic treatment for them and just educate them about oral hygiene, which goes a long, long way. Pediatric dentistry is mainly about preventative, which we'll get into, I think, a little bit later. Um, um, the whole goal of being a pediatric dentist is to mold people into becoming better patients. So what's the best way to do that is by catching them at a young age and promoting better habits and better um, better routines. So therefore you could prevent any of the disease happening. And as a pediatric dentist, if I know I can do that in a kid, um, if they say they had cavities on their baby teeth and I got to see them grow into never having cavities on their permanent teeth, I know I did my job. So uh, so that's the, one of the main reason why I love this mission trip uh, is, is you get those hands-on experience with the kids. So therefore, you already know if you want to work with kids or not. So, so that's one of the main reasons why I tell you guys, if you've not ever been involved in a mission trip in your school, try to get involved. I know there's COVID going on, but as soon as COVID is over, try to get involved. There's tons and tons of mission trip. I highly, highly recommend them. And the other thing is I do work for a residency program and we love applicants that have done mission trips because we know you've been out there and you have hands-on experience. So if you haven't done one, please, please look into it. You're gonna expand your knowledge. You're gonna learn about kids. You're gonna learn how to cater to kids. Not even for just for kids, there's other mission trips that cater towards other missions. For example, I listed below the Dominican Republic trip. That trip was mainly geared towards adults. And that's another trip based out of University of Florida. So there's tons of trips out there, guys. Do your research, go to your school, talk to them. If there's no trips, start one. Trust me, residency programs will love if you start a, pro if you start a mission trip on your own. All right, so this is a couple of pictures I wanted to put forward to talk to you guys more about the mission trip. It's an awesome experience. So pretty much on the picture, myself on the top and the guy on the right, we were the two attendings um, um, helping out. Um, and on the bottom, there's a couple of the attending and everyone else were students pretty much of, uh, at University of Florida that wanted to learn about pediatric dentistry. So they came with us. We, they got to do hands-on dentistry with us while we were right there watching them and we got to teach them everything and they loved it. And half of these kids actually, or not, I should say, ended up going into pediatric residency programs. So that's the reason why I say it's a great way to introduce yourself to what you wanna do by doing these mission trips. Um, another picture, this was from, so the last one was from two years, uh, I wanna say three years ago. This one was from four years ago. And this was the same trip as well. These were all the same kids. What I love a lot about these mission trips, especially the one that I created, the one to the Bahamas, is that we go yearly, right? Um, even though we haven't gone these past two years because of COVID, we're going to resume going next year um, or the year after, I believe. Um, we're going to resume going. So we get to see these kids every year. So it's kind of like we become their dental home. So we go to the same schools every year. We see the same kids. So we got to see them grow from pretty much from five years old all the way up until eight years old. So we haven't been back in a couple of years, but the next time we go back, these kids will be about 11 years old. So, which is kind of phenomenal. Um, all right, so that's pretty much it for the mission trip. We're gonna kind of transition a little bit more so to case presentation. I wanna present you guys a couple of cases. So you guys get to see what I deal with on a daily basis as far as a pediatric dentist. When these kids come into my office, 
What am I dealing with? What am I looking at? So you guys can have an idea. And once I finish with these case presentation, feel free to ask any questions you guys have as far as like, you know, my undergraduate career, my dental school career, residency, mission trips, feel free to ask questions away. Um, I know I spoke a little bit about those things is because I wanted to get more so into the case presentation for the for the uh, for you guys that are in, uh, that want to get involved into pediatric dentistry. I want to show you guys exactly on a daily basis. OK, if a patient walks into my office, what's my thought process? What am I thinking? What, are, what am I going through and what it, what's my goal from point A to point Z for each patient? All right. So so the first case that I'm going to talk about is this little fella right here. Uh, it's a three year old patient. He came into the office and this is exactly how they would present a case to you in your oral board examination if you want to become a pediatric dentist. So pretty much you'd be standing there and there'd be two people just asked, giving you these information and they want to know what can you do with that information? How are you going to process it and come up with a solution for lack of better words? So so a three year old male comes to your office for the first time. Right. The chief concern is I noticed there were white and brown spot on the front teeth, right? So they came into your office first time. The mom is saying there's white and brown spot on the front teeth. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the medical history. So medical history, everything is normal. The NKDA stands for no known drug allergies, okay? Um, it's just an acronym. So once I go over the medical history, you know, I go over, you know, are, are they seeing a pediatrician? Do are they seeing any cardiologists, pulmonologists? Do they have any health hazard? Do they have um, you know any health conditions? So you're asking all the parents all of these questions, and every dentist have a pretty much a, a form or a questionnaire that they have their assistants ask these patients all of these questions before you even walk in. So once I get all the medical history, which everything was normal, so I know I'm good to proceed into the next step. So the next step I'm going to do is go over the dental history. So now I'm going to ask the parents, you know. When was the last time the child went to a dentist? Have they ever seen a dentist before? How many times a day are they brushing their teeth? Are they using a fluoridated toothpaste? Are you, are, uh, do your family or does the family live in a fluoridated toothpaste or a fluoridated community, uh, I should say? Um, these are all questions that I'm asking. You might ask yourself, why am I asking these questions? Well, as a dentist, I'm putting up all these information in my head to kind of process to come up with a treatment plan for that patient, because you cannot come up with the same treatment plan for every patient, because every patient is different. Every patient comes from a different community or a different background and have different standards. So once you learn about all their practices, then you're able to go back to the lab and put together, what am I gonna come up as a plan for this child? So this child had never been to the dentist before. They only brushed their teeth once a day with a non fluoridated toothpaste and their family lived in a non fluoridated community. So. What is a non-fluoridated community? So a lot of you guys may or may not know this. All of the major communities in America are fluoridated. And the, the major, the, the limit, or I should say, or the, the threshold is usually about 0.7 parts per million in every community. So that's the amount that's allowed to, of fluoride that's allowed to be placed in the water. However, there's some communities in America that don't have fluoride in their water at all, right? These are our super, super poor communities. Um, they don't have fluoride. So what happened is these kids tend to be more prone to getting cavities. The fluoride that's placed in the water, even though lots of fluoride is not really good for us, but the amount of fluoride, since it's regulated, that's placed in the water, it actually helped to strengthen our teeth. Okay. A lot of you guys may or may not know that. So since it's regulated to a certain amount, it's not a lot of fluoride, it's, point, it's 0 0.7 parts per million. That level is an adequate level enough to help strengthen your teeth without causing any adverse reactions. Back in the days, there used to be certain communities that had no regulated fluoride amounts, so they had a bunch of fluoride. So people were coming out with the different adverse reactions to the fluoride. And there's communities that have no fluoride at all, and we see that they have a higher risk of caries. But these communities that are right there with the measured amount of fluoride, the, part, the 0.7 parts per million, tend to have the lowest amount of caries rate. So that's the reason why a lot of communities have fluoride already in their water. And so therefore we have to ask our patients these. All right, so next up is, so I went over their medical history, went over their dental history. I know what they came in for their chief concern. Now I'm starting to do my examination. Now I'm actually starting to touch the patients. Before I haven't touched them at all. I'm just asking questions. 
Now, the first thing I'm going to do is look is do an extra oral exam. So what am I doing in an actual exam? I'm looking at their head and neck. I'm looking at how tall they are. I'm looking at how big they are. Why is because you're I'm formulating all of these things for treatment purposes. Be, there, well, you may ask why does the weight and stuff take into consideration? Well, some of you guys may or may not know some kids, we can't treat them in the office, right? Because they might be too young. They might be two years old or three years old. They might be crying. You know, they might not want to open their mouth. So therefore we have to do a total physical examination. If I need to take this kid to the to general anesthesia or to do oral sedation, that kid has to then fit a certain mold or a certain criteria of height and weight for, for them to qualify to be a sedation patient. That might be a little bit too advanced for you guys right now, but so those are the reason why when we do an extra oral exam, we're looking at the height, we're looking at the weight, we're looking at the head and neck area. And for this kid, for the purposes of this case presentation, everything was within normal limits. So the kid fell within the 50th percentile. So that he was an average child, I should say. So once I continued from my, you know, medical history, dental history, extra oral exam, now I then proceed into my intra oral exam. Now I'm actually having the child open their mouth. Let's see what's going on inside the mouth. So what am I looking at? First, I'm looking at the gums. You want to look at the gums. Why? Because the gums tell you if a kid is brushing or not, for lack of a better word. Right. If a kid is not brushing very well, they're going to have inflamed tissues. They're going to be some red areas around. If a kid is brushing, their gums will be a lot more pinkish looking and a lot more healthier. So we look at the gums and obviously we want to look for pathologies as well. Um, the other thing we're going to start looking at after the soft tissue is we're going to go to the hard tissue. By hard tissue, now I'm going to look at the teeth. So as soon as I open the mouth, I don't go directly to the teeth. I'm looking at the surroundings. So I'm looking at the gums, the tongue the back of the throat, I'm looking at all these things. And then once I've looked at those things, then I proceed and start looking at the teeth, right? So for this child, their soft tissues were within normal limit, except a few areas of, of inflammation, meaning there was a few areas of redness. And then there was carous lesions noted on the facial surfaces of teeth, DEF. Now you might ask yourself, what is DEF? So for primary teeth or for baby teeth, we don't use numbers, okay? We use letters, alphabet letters. It's just, I don't know why, but it, I think it's cute, all right? So for adults, we use numbers, right? We go one, two, three, number one through 32. For kids, we, grow, we go from number A, right? We go all the way from A, it goes all the way to the other side to J, then it drops down to K, then it swings around to T. So that's how we count our teeth, right? It goes A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J. Then we go to the bottom and we proceed. And you should have 10 teeth up top and 10 teeth up in the bottom. So each child should have about 20 teeth. So when I say the teeth D, E, F, G, so if you wanna count, I, I say we start with the letter A, right? A, B, C, D. So you know that D should be the fourth tooth. Starting from the back, going to the front, it should be the fourth tooth because A, B, C, D. So the canine, which is your, your little pointy teeth, which you guys are vampire teeth, people like to call them. That's the third tooth from the back on a child. So that's the third tooth. So that's A, B, C. So that should be C. The fourth tooth is D, which is this tooth right here. The fifth tooth is E, and then the next tooth is F. So these three teeth we found had the brownish to yellowish spot that we noted, which we classified as carous lesions or cavities. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is to take an x-ray. For kids that are that young, you don't wanna just bring them into the, your office and start taking x-rays. It could be very difficult for them. So you wanna have a reason to take the x-rays. So it's a little bit different for adults and kids. For adults, you walk into the office, they'll take an x-ray and do all of, and then you go do an exam. For kids that young, we don't put them through x-rays if they don't need to, okay? So they go through a physical examination, the actual exam, actual exam. And then if I look into the mouth and I see anything, then I take an x-ray, all right? So then I took my x-ray, the x-ray is right here, and you guys can see what's going on. So I'll describe this picture. So at the bottom, you're looking at the baby teeth. And then the teeth that you're looking at the top, those are the permanent teeth that are gonna come in to replace the baby teeth, all right? I know it looks a little weird and some of you have probably never seen a picture like this before. So once I take my x-ray and I review the x-ray, that's when I come up with a diagnosis and treatment plan, all right? So my diagnosis for this kid is that this kid had early childhood caries, right? So what is early childhood caries? So that is pretty much me just saying that the kid has caries or has cavities. But, and for pediatric dentistry, 
that is the technical um, di diagnostic terminology to use for a kid that's three years old that has this, this amount of caries. We call it early childhood caries. And typically, what is early childhood caries caused by? You would say, why does a three-year-old have cavities? Well, the most common reason for a three-year-old to get caries is going to sleep with the bottle. So if we have any moms in the chat or any moms watching, putting your child to sleep right after breastfeeding or putting your child to sleep with the bottle is the number one reason that they're gonna get cavities, okay? Especially in the front teeth, all right? So keep that in mind, everyone. And if you are breastfeeding or if you are, uh, you have a child that's, you know, you need to give them milk, just make sure you wipe their teeth before they go to bed or at least give them some water, okay? Do not let them go to sleep with milk in their mouth. All right, so once I come up with the diagnosis, which was early childhood caries, now I have to come up with a plan. What's the plan? I can't only just fix the teeth because I can fix the teeth, but if I didn't really do any sort of um, um, intervention to change something in these patients' life or the parents' life, nothing's gonna happen. So that's where it's very important in pediatric dentistry. And I stated before, the preventative plan is the most important part of our job. I can go on and fix as many teeth as possible, right? But if I'm not actually impacting them and, and, and telling them, hey, this is, or educating them, this is what you should do or shouldn't be doing, then am I really doing anything? Not really. So, so not only do I have to fix these teeth, I have to come up with a preventative plan. So for this, for the, uh, for, um, for lack of, uh, of time, I'm just gonna kind of shorten this. And pretty much the plan that I came up with this kid was, let me see if I have it. No, I don't have it on the next slide. So let's go back. So the plan that I came up with this kid was, this kid had to go to sedation, you know, um, so we had to put them under uh, sedation, oral sedation. So we gave them medication because they were too difficult. They were crying, kind of moving around. We couldn't do anything in the, uh, in the chair. So we had to uh, uh, do oral sedation. We gave them a little bit of medication, nitrous oxide, and we did strip crowns on those teeth. Strip crowns are pretty much white crowns for the front teeth. All right. So after I did those crowns, I went and we sat down with the mom. We talked about everything that was going on at home. You know, they were only brushing one time a day. Remember from the slide before, let's go back. They were brushing once a day. So I went over how many times you're supposed to brush. You're supposed to brush twice a day. So morning and night, the parents didn't know that. Not every parent knows that. I went over how long you're supposed to brush. You're supposed to brush for two minutes in the morning and two minutes at night. Um, they were not using a fluoridated toothpaste. So I went over using a fluoridated toothpaste. Um, also, how much toothpaste to use. Most people don't know how much toothpaste to use. If your child is three years old, uh, or uh, excuse me, if your child is under three years, they should be using a smear size, which is the tiniest bit of toothpaste. If your child is over three to six years old, they can use a pea size, which is just like a little round pea. Um, I also went over, um, um, we call this anticipatory guidance and, 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 and dentistry. That's the terminology for educating the parents about all of the different things they should be aware of. Um, I went over um, the fact that they had no fluoride in their water. You know, they should look into possibly, you know, obviously we can't help them move anywhere financially, but at least drinking certain uh, water from different sources that have fluoride in the water so they can get that protection. Um, we also went over, you know, when the teeth are gonna start falling out so that the parents are ready and know when the teeth are gonna start falling out and the new teeth are gonna start coming in. We went over diet, you know, what they're supposed to be eating, you know, the sweets and the, the, the sodas and all of that. So these are all things that we're educating patients about and parents about when they come to the pediatric dentist. Um, unfortunately, you're not getting all of these things at a general dentist because that's technically not their job. Some general dentists are doing this, you know what I mean? Because, you know, they, they love educating people, they love educating their patients, but for a pediatric dentist, it's our job to educate the parents and the kids. So that's why it's very, very important to bring your kids to a pediatric dentist at an early age so that they can get that interaction with the dentist so that we can help mold them into better dental patients, right? A lot of patients, they're scared of the uh, dentist. Why? Because they never really went to the dentist as a kid, you know? And I guarantee you, you take your kids to the dentist as a kid, they spend time with a dentist that they like. Nine, chances are nine out of 10, they're not gonna have cavities and they're gonna grow up to be great dental patients, all right? So this is it for this case. That's what I did with this little fellow. And I'm gonna go on to the another type of case. So you guys can see the other type of pediatric dentistry. So not only are we treating these little, little kids, but we're also treating, you know, 
adults or uh, older kids, I should say. So for example, this kid came in, he was, um, he was a healthy kid, 14 year old. He came in to the dentist. He was playing bef- uh, the night before basketball and hit his tooth and fractured his. We get this a lot. And if, uh, as a pediatric dentist, it's, this usually happens at nine o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, we'll get a call. And technically by law, as a pediatric dentist, you have to take emergencies. General dentist, I'm not really sure, but as a pediatric dentist, you have to be able to take emergencies, okay? Um, so this kid called us, he was like, oh, we were playing basketball, you know, hit his tooth and the tooth broke. And I'm sure you guys had someone in your family or maybe it was you that broke your tooth. So they came in, first thing I went over is the medical history, right? Like I went, I stated from before. Everything in this kid was fine. He wasn't seeing any doctors. He wasn't seeing, you know, he was perfectly healthy kid. After I went over my medical history, the next thing was the dental history, right? So I'm asking him a question. When was the last time you went to the dentist? Um, you know, how, how often are you brushing your teeth? So I'm asking him gathering information as far as the dental history. So the last time he went to the dentist was about three months ago for an exam and everything was fine. There was no caries or nothing. So that was great, right? So I know I could take everything else out the picture and could, I could just focus on the emergency. So after I went over medical, dental, now I'm doing my exam, my physical examination, right? So first extra old exam, I'm looking on the outside. So since this kid told me he came and he hit his tooth, so there was trauma involved, right? So I have to look at the bigger picture. I have to look at maybe he had a concussion, maybe he has cuts on his head and neck area. Maybe he fractured a bone or something like that. So you have to look at the bigger picture. For this kid, the good thing is everything else was fine, no concussion, just the fractured tooth. So then I proceed and went on to the intro exam. So now I'm going inside the mouth to look at the mouth. So what do I look at first? The soft tissue. So I'm looking at the gums, the tongue area, just to make sure that there's no cuts, there's no lacerations and everything is looking good, right? So there was no findings for the soft tissue. Then I go on to the hard tissue. So now I'm looking at the teeth. When I say hard tissue, we were talking about the teeth. So now I'm looking at the teeth. So I looked at all the teeth. Everything was fine except for tooth number nine. So remember what I said before, we were talking about baby teeth. We were talking about letters, right? A, B, C, D, E. So now we're talking about permanent teeth or adult teeth. We're going to be talking about numbers. So for adult teeth, we start from number one, number one, and we go to all the way over here to number 17, so oh, yeah, 16 over here, then 17 all the way to 32. The good news is most people don't have number one, number 16, 17, or 32 because those are our wisdom teeth, right? So we start with number two and we swing around and then so far and so forth. So the front teeth are gonna be, if you count, starting from number two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine is gonna be one of your front tooth, right? So he fractured tooth number nine, he traumatized it. So that's pretty much what I saw. So now I have all my information, right? Medical history, dental history. I did an extra oral exam, intra oral exam. Now I have to come up with what? A diagnosis and a treatment plan. So what is my diagnosis? My diagnosis is an uncomplicated crown fracture. So there's two types of crown fractures. There could be a complicated, there could be a non or uncomplicated or non-complicated, same word. So a complicated root fracture, a complicated crown fracture is a fracture of the crown that goes down to the nerve. So you'll, so you'll see for this kid, um, you can't really see that well, but just believe me, trust me guys. Um, so we fra- this kid fractured this tooth, but the nerve was not showing at all. So it's called an uncomplicated crown fracture. Had he fractured the tooth and the the nerve was showing and the tooth was bleeding, that would be a complicated fracture. And if that would happen, he would would definitely need a root canal. I'd have to send him out somewhere to get a root canal. So for this kid, it was an uncomplicated crown fracture. The nerve was not involved, which was awesome. All right. So what did I do next is I took my x-ray. I reviewed them. Everything looks fine. Now I have to come up with my treatment plan. Now, you guys would think, this is super easy. Let me just fix the tooth. He goes home, blah, 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 blah. So technically, this kid had to walk around with his tooth chipped like that for two weeks. You ask yourself, why? Dr. Lolo's mean. He's making him walk around with a chipped tooth. No, that's not true at all. So let's take this, let's take this into consideration. It's like, let's say if you broke your arm or lack of, let's say your, your ankle. If you're running, you're a runner, 
I like to play sports. And you're running, right? Bam, 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 bam. And then you twist your ankle and you break it. How long is it going to take you to start running again? It's not, you're not going to be able to run the next day or the day after or the day after or the day after. Or the day after. It's going to take a couple of weeks. So, so that's the same thing with teeth, guys. If you fracture your tooth, I'm not going to let you use your tooth right away. The reason being is the, the more pressure or the more forces you then add to that tooth, you're actually increasing your chances of that tooth dying, meaning the nerve, because once that kid hit the tooth, right, boom, even though the nerve wasn't showing, the nerve was traumatized technically, right, because it got hit. So if I were to fix the tooth right away, the kid's going to go home, the tooth is fixed, he's going to go right back to eat, eating, you know, normal stuff, and he's not going to even think about the tooth was fractured. So he's going to start eating and eating and then therefore introducing more trauma to the tooth that he just hit. So it's kind of like you broke your ankle and then you put an ankle brace on and you forget about it and you just go right back to just doing everything you want to do with running. And so therefore you're going to injure your ankle even more. So that's what happened with teeth. If you fracture it, what we do is we put a Band-Aid filling on it, a temporary filling. We tell the kid to go home soft food diet for about two weeks because we don't want them chewing anything hard with those front teeth. We don't want them chewing at all. Uh, no chewing on the front tooth for two weeks. We put a sedative filling, kind of like a Band-Aid. We put something to cover it so it's not sensitive. And then we tell the kid to come back in two weeks. Once they return in two weeks, we take a new x-ray. We reevaluate the tooth. We test it to make sure it's not hurting him anymore. And then I do the filling and do the final restoration. So this final restoration was done two weeks after the injury. And then after that, everything was fine. Um, and you guys can check out my Instagram. I actually have the video of that kid that came in with that tooth uh, broken. And it's on my Reels page. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for that guy. So that's it for the case presentation, guys. Now I'm going to open up the floor now. If you guys have any questions as far as undergrad, dental school, specialty, uh, working in a hospital, working at a private office, mission trips, any anything you guys could think of, what it's like to be a pediatric dentist, this is your opportunity to ask away. All right. So I'll give you guys some time. Thank you so much, Dr. Lola, for this presentation. It was amazing. I'm going to go ahead and start asking you some questions that uh, some of our viewers today asked. And the first one is, um, any American schools that their graduates can only work in the province they graduated from? Can you repeat the question? Sorry. Uh, so it says, um, are there any American schools that their graduates can only work in the province they graduated from? Um, so the way that the Board of Dentistry work, they have regions, right? So once you graduate from a certain school, you take a board exam and that specific board exam covers a specific area. So I chose to go to the University of Florida because I wanted to work in Florida, right? But the board exam that I took at the University of Florida technically qualifies me to work in certain other states. I want to say it's about 13 states. Don't quote me on this. You can get the information somewhere else. But that board exam that I took in Florida covers me for about 10 to 13 states that I can choose to work. So therefore, if there's a state or a place that you want to work in, particularly, you have to make sure that the dental school that you're going to um, that the board exam that they're providing covers that area. Now, there's a way around that. Let's say if I wanted to work somewhere where my board exam was not accepted, well, you know, all I would have to do is go to that area, go to their board of dentistry and take their board exam. I don't have to do the schooling all over, just the board exam. It's not ideal, but I know a lot of people that's had to take multiple board exam so that they can work in different areas. I hope that answered your question. Yes, awesome. The next question is, what does your typical work day look like? Kind of like the workflow with your staff and all. Perfect. So, so since I work both in the hospital and at a private office, it's, a, it's two different answers for both. And I'll give you both answers if you want. Um, I'll start with the hospital. So the hospital, I work, I work there four days. Um, so one of the days I'm actually um, in the operating room with a resident. So I'm hands on. It's myself, usually a first year or a second year resident. And we're, we have about three cases of, of, uh, of uh, three cases to do under general anesthesia. So what I mean by general anesthesia is these kids are usually about two, three, four, five year old kids that has a bunch of cavities. So like, I want to say about eight, nine, 10 or more cavities, and they can't sit in the chair to do the work. So we take them to the operating room, we put them to sleep. 
and it's myself and a resident and we're pretty much we're doing the whole entire case so we take care of the whole mouth in one day so we do about three of those that's usually how my monday goes um we start around seven and we usually finish around two o'clock on my tuesdays um it's usually the days that i'm in my office i'm preparing lectures for the residents or i'm signing my notes or i'm doing research or things of that nature on Wednesdays is usually the days that I'm in the operating room by myself. So I'm treating my own patients and in, 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 in the operating room. So these kids are being put to sleep and it's just me by myself without any residents. Uh, on Thursdays, the fourth days is my clinical days. So that's kind of like the days that I'm overrunning the entire clinic. And the clinic is uh, the with our residency program. We see about I want to say on average, about 100 patients a day, but it's not just one doctor taken into consideration. We have about 10 residents, right? So um, we're seeing all those patients throughout the day, but I'm just overseeing everyone. So all the residents are doing the work and they're just reporting to me. Um, if they have any issues, I go in there and I help them. On Fridays is the day that I'm, in, I'm actually working at a private office as a pediatric dentist on my own. So I see about 40 to 50 patients a day. Um, keep in mind, not everyone seeing is seeing that many patients a day. I choose to do that just because I'm able to do it. And I felt like Nick's children prepared me to do it. Um, it's, I, that's why I love that program so much. So I, I'm able to see about 40 to 50 patients a day. And the way that I do it is I see about uh, 25 to 30 patients in the morning and about 20 patients in the afternoon. And what I try to do is I see about two restoratives every hour in the morning. And then I schedule about four, uh, four columns of, of uh, sorry, four rows of patients. If uh, I'm just gonna try to put it as visual as possible. So I have four rows of patients coming in and out of those patients, they're gonna be, eight of them are gonna be restoratives in the morning. And then the remainder are gonna be recall exam, meaning they're just coming for a cleaning, um, for uh, you know just a checkup and stuff of that nature. So in the afternoon, I reduce my amount of restorative. I think I see about four restoratives in the afternoon, and then I see the rest um, are recall exam. And on Fridays, I work starting from about eight, and I end around four, four thirty. Now it's gonna differ from everyone. Different pediatric dentists have different modalities. Some of them see restoratives in the morning and just recalls in the afternoon. Some of them only see about twenty patients a day, thirty patients a day. I choose to see about 40 patients a day. It is a lot, but um, I, I, I think I handle it quite well. And I feel like I'm super young, I'm energetic. You know, if, if I'm not doing it now, then why, when am I gonna do it? You know what I mean? So that's pretty much what my workflow is. I get a great balance of both the hospital and the private office. So um, it's kind of like a very well-rounded um, experience, which I kind of love. <laughs> awesome. And then our next question is, how do you prevent burnout in the career or keep a positive mindset when doing dentistry? That's a great question. So um, I do find myself feeling burnt out sometimes. I'm not going to lie. Like you'll be working and then like you, you'll just be like, man, I'm tired. Well, I'll be real with you. As hard as I go in working, guys, that's the same way I am when, when it comes to my downtime and enjoying my life. Um, I, I'm a hundred percent, I value work-life balance. Like I a hundred percent, meaning like, I, I don't need the, with some of my best friends, I have uh, athletic friends or some friends that are, you know, athletes and, uh, and professionals and stuff like that. Some of the most successful people I know are the people that parties or, or vacation artists that I know why you got to be able to disconnect yourself from every do. So and dentistry, especially in pediatric dentistry, it's tough, man. You're in there. I'm pretty much on stage, like a like a like a performance. You know, you gotta be on your aim. You gotta be nice to all of them. If you're mean to one of them, mom's gonna be like, "Oh, you mean to my kid? You were so nice to this kid." You told this kid this story, but you didn't tell my kid this story. So you have to give all your patients your all. So by the time you're done, you're drained. So you have to find that balance. So what do I do? I tend to take days off. Like on, on every month, I tend to have a long weekend. I try to take a Friday and a Monday off. I do a little trip. I get away. I do something to relax. I work out a lot. I go running a lot. Um, I love being out on the water. I love traveling. Obviously, because of COVID, I'm, I'm unable to travel as much, but I was still able to go to Haiti 
and a couple of places during this whole lockdown, which don't tell anybody anyone. But anyways, um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I truly, truly value work-life balance, guys. And if you know me, if you're my friend, the same energy you see that I'm working, that you see on these videos on TikTok or whatever, is the same energy when I'm out having fun and enjoying my life. Because if you don't do that and take days off and provide for yourself, you're not going to be able to be yourself at work. So, and that goes for all of you dental students and stuff like that. Don't be ashamed or, or, or shy to take a vacation and take a trip. Even if, you know, you may not have the fun, just plan accordingly because you're, you're, you are your business, I should say, meaning like your body is your job. And if your body can't go, if your body is not happy, then you're not able to produce that craft that you're producing and you're not able to make a living. So that's the best way I can describe that. You know, you guys have to work life balance is very, very important. So branching off of burnout, have you ever felt stuck during a diagnosis? Um, and then how would you proceed from there? Or is there like someone that you turn to? Um, so yeah, there are, there's going to be time that, you know, you're not going to know everything that's with everything in life. You know, you never know everything, but it's something that you shouldn't be afraid of. I, I feel like my patients and my, the parents, I should say, they love the fact that I'll tell them straight up, look, I have no idea what's going on here. You should go see somebody else. And they appreciate me for that. Instead of me trying to, you know, for lack of a better word, BS them and, and tell them I know what I'm doing or this and that and end up doing a bad job. So my recommendation is own your craft, know what you're good at. I know what I'm good at and I know what I'm confident at doing. If something comes to me and I automatically know that I'm not confident at doing it, I'm not even going to touch it. I'm going to tell the parents, you know, I, I can't do this. I'm sorry. Like there's somebody else out there that can do it better than I can. And I'll just refer them to that. It could be a, another pediatric dentist. It could be another general dentist. I know there's tons of pediatric dentists that are out there that sends their kids to me because they can't do certain stuff and they know that I can do it and vice versa. There's stuff that I can do. I send them to other stuff. So there's nothing to be shy about. Own it, you know, tell the parents, I don't know. And then they'll respect you for that. So that's the best way I deal with that. Awesome. And then we'll go ahead and close with one more question, which is how do you deal with difficult patients and what are some techniques you use to help relax them? All right. So that's a great question. So how do we deal with difficult patients and pediatric dentistry? So that's pretty much what our job is, dealing with difficult patients, because all of the good patients, trust me, they're being seen by general dentists, um, because if a general dentist could see a kid, they'll see them as long as the kid is able to behave. Trust me on that one. So we end up seeing all the bad kids or not all of them, but a lot of them. So we have we, we we use what we call our behavior management skills, right? So these are courses that we take in residency to teach us how to manage kids. There's a bunch of techniques. I'll go over a couple of you guys, a couple with you guys, since we're gonna be wrapping up soon. One of them is tell show do. If you guys go to my Instagram, Dr. Underscore P Lolo, I have tons of video of me using tell show do. What is tell show do? A kid comes in, they're terrified, right? Most kids are terrified. They, they're curious. They don't know what's going on. They want to know what's going on because they're learning about the world, right? So tell, show, do is exactly what it is. You're telling them what you're doing. You're showing them what you're doing. Then you actually do it. But the trick is you can't tell them exactly what you're doing. You have to tell it in a way for like a, in a kid terminology and you play with their imagination. But at the same time, you can't lie because if you're lying, then the parents are going to be like, oh, you're lying to my kid. What are you doing? So if you guys watch any of my videos, I make up these stories, but even though they sound weird, they're not lies. They're just a, a modified version. So for example, let's say if I have a kid that's coming in and I know I need to give him a shot, right? So, and I know he's scared. First thing I do, I take out the syringe and I show it to them. I literally show it to them. I know you, you guys might say it sounds crazy, but if you guys check out my video, I show it to them. I don't show them the needle, I keep it covered. And I show them, look, this is my water gun. I'm going to put it next to your tooth. It's going to spray out water. This is the water. And then they're like, oh, okay, that's not so bad. Then, so I, sh I told them, then I showed them, and then I actually went and did it. Now, let's say if that same kid, I didn't show them anything at all. I didn't tell them anything at all. They were scared. And I just get a syringe. They know what a syringe is. They know what a needle is supposed to look like. So as soon as you pull that out, they're going to freak out. So in, so in order for me to avoid that, I get in with him. So I start talking to him. I, well, let me, so for me to backtrack a little bit, first, I built rapport, meaning like I, I try to become their friends. So like, I'm like, oh, hey, Johnny, you know, how are you? What'd you do today? How was school? Um, what's your favorite game? You know, what's your favorite sport? So I try to become their friend. Once I'm their friend, 
you know, I don't know a kid alive that don't want to be my friend. They all want to be my friend. So let's just boost in a little bit. But anyways, but once they're my friend, I got them in the bag, right? Because they're going to listen to me. So now I start my storytelling. So I do my tell show do. Then I proceed to do it. Another technique that I use is distraction. Distraction is when you try to distract them. You tell them a story. You know, you start telling them, oh, Johnny, remember that soccer game you had last week? How was the soccer game? Did you score a goal? And then you start doing your stuff while you're talking to them. So that's another uh, technique that I use. Another technique is we use laughing gas, which is these are pharmaceutical techniques. The laughing gas, we, you know, you guys have heard of this before. It just makes the kids laugh and makes them feel funny. It relaxes them. And it, 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 it helps them be more acceptive to what you're telling them, for lack of a better word. Um, and then the last thing sometimes I use is, is voice control. Um, voice control is something that I don't like to use a lot because I'm already a tall, big, dark, intimidating guy. So the kids are already, you know, some of them are already scared of me. So I try not to use voice control. I try to be the, their friend first. And then I use distraction. Then if none of that stuff is working, I pull the parents aside and I tell them, look, I have to change my whole demeanor right now because this kid is not listening. And I could tell that, you know, you know, they they tend to get stuff their way. So now I'm going to change my mood. I'm not going to be their friends. I'm going to raise my voice. I'm not going to yell at them, but I'm going to be super strict and I'm going to be mean to them a little bit. And then the parents will be like, yeah, that's cool. Da, da, da. As long as you tell them. So then I go back to the kid, the same kid that I was, hey, Johnny, how are you doing before in the beginning? I'm like, hey, Johnny, man, I'm not your friend today. You're being a bad patient. I don't know what's wrong with you. And you know, I know your teacher, right? And I'm definitely going to tell your teacher, you're a bad, bad patient today. And I'm not giving you no toys. And don't talk to me before you leave here. And I know you want to shake my hand. I love that. And I walk away or I'll make up another story. And literally, the fact that you change your demeanor, the kids are like, what the heck is going on? And then usually that gets them to go. So those are kind of like the behavior management techniques that I like to use. And if all else fails, then we, have, we put them under general anesthesia or we use oral sedation. So I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Yes, it does. Actually, no wonder why, you know, my pediatric dentist back in the days, you know, could actually perform procedures on me. and didn't realize that was actually a technique. So thank you for sharing that. Okay. Um, I want to go ahead and thank everyone for tuning in to today's session. We really look forward to you guys tuning into our next virtual session, which should be about two days from now. Uh, but other than that, thank you so much, Dr. Lolo, for joining us today. We are so happy and grateful that you were able to make it. Um, and as for our viewers, we will go ahead and see you soon. Thank